So we'll move on now to our last speaker of the morning, um, which is Bob Haycock. Until recent retirement, Bob worked for the Countryside Council for Wales as Senior Reserves Manager in Pembrokeshire, with responsibility for managing national nature reserves. Together with his wife Annie, Bob is a regional representative for the British Trust for Ornithology. He is also chairman of the Pembrokeshire Bird Group, a director of WWBIC, and a former council member for the Welsh Ornithological Society. As well as his own ornithological interests, Bob has a wide interest in the county's natural history and has been actively involved with studying wildlife in Pembrokeshire for nearly 40 years. So Bob, over to you. Okay, okay. I'll just put my share screen on, I hope. Um, right. That should be it, I believe. What's that? Yeah. I'm seeing, I'm seeing everything about Zoom, but not my, not my actual screen. Um, just a minute. Oh, we can see it. You can. Right. Mm. Interesting. Right. You've got, you've got it now, I hope. Yeah. Without, yeah. Now, I'm just going to change the display settings. Gosh, it's running very slowly. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Well, I'll, I'll do this. notes. View Sorry? Again. Sorry? Notes view. I'm on what view? Um, if you go to the display settings at the top. Yeah. And then click swap. Well, I just, okay. There we go, that's better, thank you. Okay, uh, all right. <laughs> it's not so good for me, but I, I, I can see, right. I'll go on quickly then. Um, some of you may have seen this book, um, which was published last year. Uh, it basically is quite a tome, um, but if you haven't seen it, I, it's a good read, I hope. Um, but I just wanted to explain a bit about how this book came about. Um, basically, aviafauna's there are a lot of them around, uh, usually county-based, but some national ones as well. And back in the early 1990s, the, these people, Roger Lovegrove, um, you may not know, Graham Williams and Yola Williams, uh, all of them working for the RSPB at the time. Yola, of course, is well known um, as an independent ornithologist these days, a naturalist. Um, but they produced this first uh, burst in a series, actually, of, of about, well, they were third in the series of four that came out in this sort of early 1990s to early 2000s period of these national uh, or sort of country-based avifaunas, which is quite a, quite a thing in its day. Um, the time goes by, and those are, those are just basically some of the other books that were produced at the time, that, that part of a series produced by Poyser, and there was also a supplement produced by the Welsh Ornithological Society in the early 2000s to update things at that time. But time goes by, and um, after about 30 years, we, the Welsh Ornithological Society in particular was well aware that there were a lot of changes going on in the Welsh avifauna, some good, some bad, but clearly the book that was produced 30 years earlier was not quite up to date these days. And two of the editors in concerned, uh, Rion Pritchard and Julian Hughes, used to go to council meetings of Welsh Ornithological Society, of which I was also a, a council member at that time, um, were considering, you know, there ought to perhaps be a new book to update things. And so in 2018, uh, was council agreed that it could be done if we could fund it in some way, it's going to be quite a costly thing to produce. And a contract was agreed, a uh, price was agreed with Liverpool University Press, who are quite uh, extremely good publishers, to produce what we hope would be um, a very good, you know, publication. So in 2019, things sort of kicked off. Five editors were appointed, all of them part of the Welsh Northern Society, by the council members or former council members. Four of them were in North Wales, because that's where the whole project was, was started, really. And two have to be directors of Lurks, uh, myself in WW Bick and Ian Spence, who's with Covnod. Some of you may know Ian. So uh, it was it was an interesting sort of starting point. It all seemed nice, nice and gentle at the beginning. This is the editorial team. Um, this picture was actually taken after the book was published, um, uh, I have to say. So we all look quite happy and relieved. Um, it was uh, it had been some quite a quite a journey really to get there. And um, this is the first time we'd actually been able to meet face to face since the whole work started because of COVID, as I shall mention in a minute. 
Anyway, from left to right, we've got Ian Spence, Trion Pritchard, um, who is the county recorder for Carnarvonshire. Ian, Ian's a county court, court county um, bird recorder for um, the Cluid area. And Brenchley, his partner, is also a freelance um, ecologist. And myself, and then Julian Hughes, who works at the RSPB, head of species. Uh, there are a couple of other people who couldn't be with us on that day. Ben Porter from North Wales was in the Faroes. He's a photographic editor. And we also had considerable help from Reg Thorpe, who used to work for the RSPB, and John Green and Robin Sandham, who we got involved particularly with the rare species that we have to include in the book. Uh, Philip Snow, some of you may have seen his works, painted the cover, a very fine artist based in, in Wales. But as I say, we are only part of the whole story of this publication. Quite a lot of organisation involved. Um, First of all, we've got to think about the number of species we've got to include that have gone up in 30 years to about 450 species or so. Um, we actually decided to break it up into about six sections as far as the species accounts were concerned to make it more manageable by, by the editor's concern. And each editor was suggested to people who could write accounts for the book because we couldn't do this ourselves. There are various people with expert knowledge we, 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 we look to to actually write the accounts. And, um, First, each editor was given a section to do all the primary editorial work on when you actually received these species accounts. Ian got really sort of bogged down with lots of things and it, because he had skills in GIS and particularly doing charts and things, he uh, agreed to do all of that work and relieved his duties of, of actual uh, editorial duties, I should say. And he produced huge numbers of charts and maps and things. Um, and the rare species accounts, as I say, were prepared by John Green. And, uh, Rob, John Green is our county recorder from Pembrokeshire, and Robin Sandham, Sandham is based up in North Wales. And um, with some considerable help, as I say, from other people as well. Um, ben Porter got involved, various photographers in Wales, because there's a lot of bird photographers around. Um, must have been about 30 or 40 people to contact at least. In, and Ben was able to sort of gather photos from all quarters of Wales. So that was the sort of start of it, I suppose. 2020, though, was, was a very interesting year, I'm sure, as, as I'm sure we all know. Um, <clears throat> it just all started to take shape in a gentle sort of way at the end of 2019. And we ended 2020 with quite a few of the species accounts already starting to be drafted. We were very happy. It was all nice and hunky-dory. Early meetings, though, were up in North Wales. I, I, was a, I was a corresponding member. In fact, I had a phone call asking me if I'd get involved with this, and somebody said, oh, just a few species to edit, nothing much. So I said, oh, that's, that's fine. I didn't realise it was going to take me a whole year of 24 hours a day, pretty well, seven days a week. But nevertheless, I, I was part of the team. Two meetings were held, in fact, in North Wales in January, February 2020. Then comes along COVID and lockdown commenced. So... What do we do? Um, we're obviously not supposed to go out and do things, although some people clearly could, um, as we, we've learned since. So how did we manage to continue with all the editing duties and meetings? Well, the answer was Zoom, as I'm sure we're using Zoom now. They seem to be the saviour of everything. Now we can all contribute evenly, equally to the meetings. So um, Zoom, yes, it was the saviour to some extent, um, created its own issues and problems, but um, this is the team here with Robin and, and Ben th thrown in for good measure as well. So we met regularly um, to discuss how the book was going to shape up. Um, just a sort of general idea, I suppose, of how things flowed throughout the book and the nice gentle colours at the beginning. It was all nice and soft and easy. Um, things starting to come together. Um, accounts being drafted, sent to section editors. We, de we devised a system of putting th things into Dropbox because well, it'll hold you know everything we could all see each other's work we could see all the all the accounts and sharing them through Dropbox was a bit clunky but a very much uh, a very good idea um, things start to warm up a bit um, we start to look at all the different accounts and we did then engage with a low load of section uh, checkers because when a section was completed of say 50 60 species we would ship it off to quite a few different people around Wales. These are mostly county recorders, experts, um, experts in a particular species, people like Professor Heaton Newton and a few others like that, to actually look at it and say, what do you think of these drafts? You know, to, is there anything missing? Are there any extra information that you could add from your county that, is, that this author didn't know about? You know, is there something, something new or, or, or just something wrong? And so they have a very important role to check the process. 
And so any suggested changes came back to the section editors. Then there were, there were you know, the queries were dealt with. Um, the original um, accounts were sent back to the authors to, to review and agree a change that were being put forward. Things are warming up and getting hotter because the year of 2020 is progressing and we've got a deadline for the spring of, 20, of, of in fact, November 2020 to get it all finished. So we, we go on through the year, get involved proofreaders, all sorts of different people. And so by the November 2020, getting a bit hot, um, you know, are we going to make it? We've managed to get everything done off in time for the, for the publishers to actually start working on it. And then um, all the proof checking done in the spring of 2021, published in, in, um, in July 2021. I mustn't forget the huge amount of information that was coming through all the time, the seemingly endless phone calls. You know, we were working sometimes from three of us, three or four o'clock in the morning, uh, until midnight on, on certain days to get things done, you know, answering queries, checking all sorts of things. And then as we got towards the end, we were still working on rare species which were being updated for the whole of Wales. You know, there was a whole review going on, which was just about finished in time to make sure we had the right species in the book that we could actually publish confidently. So as we were going through the process, we, you know, we sort of, we were realizing, gosh, you know, how did they produce the original 1994 publication? Because an awful lot of things were, were known then, really. For example, there was no real data for national surveys, much less accessible. Um, and, you know, the, the things we do now, things like the National Breeding Bird Survey, which is run by the BTO and the RSPB, we just weren't being, they just weren't happening back in 1994. Um, Welsh bird reports and county bird reports had fewer records, probably fewer birders were submitting records in those days. So there was much less you know, information available generally. But clearly 30 years later, the big game changer was the internet. A lot more information now can be gathered quickly and efficiently from that source. Many papers are available at the tap of a keyboard or a click of a mouse. So that was clearly important for us to be able to access that information from those sources as well as, of course, looking for the original book as well. So these are the sort of things that probably weren't available in the early book. We had to sort of think about this and we had to get you know, authors to st and steer them carefully so that we could distill this information in a really reasonably consistent way. And we developed a house style to show how, how we wanted the basic species accounts to look, the templates, etc., suggested reference and sources of information. And although things started to happen slowly at first, written accounts soon started to fly in, which was very pleasing. But these are sort of things that were not available back in 1994. I mean, for example, BBS trends, there are these trends now produced each year. So we can see how species are doing um, from large amounts of data coming in throughout the whole country and from Wales on its own for that matter. And this is from just an example of Willow Warbler. The Wetland Birds Survey um, developed um, very strongly in the sort of last 30 years and there's, there's an index for these are wintering species in this case and this one happens to be water rail where we could do a Welsh index on that species which again wasn't available 30 years ago. And we now also have, although we've got bird observatory data and that, that they've been going for quite a few years prior to the 1990s, but the bird observatories have now got all of their records, all their daily log records loaded into bird track which is a fantastic asset and it means you've got thousands and what, millions of records and so we could actually look at the trends for migrant species picked up every day from the bird observatories and look at that particular source this happens to be chiff chaff well that wasn't available you know it, it would have been a mammoth task to undertake this in, in 1994. Um, Welsh bird reports now have a lot more information so you can actually get some sort of trends for records coming in on a species like yellow wagtail, which is a very declining species in Wales, very rare these days, and doesn't really occur in, in our region as a breeding species, breeding species very much. We also have the rare birds records coming through the Welsh Rarities Advisory Group, as it used to be known, now the Welsh Rarities Committee. And we could plot all that information on, on maps. This happens to be corncrake records over the years. This again, is, a, is it's, all digit, it's all digitized now, so we've got access to it. Um, ringing data from the BTO happens to be grey wagtail ringing recoveries um, to show where birds are being found uh, when they've been uh, in Wales or elsewhere. Um, and we've also had the privilege of more recent bird atlases, um, breeding bird atlases at national as well as local level at tetrad or, or uh, hectad level. So all this extra information is available now. 
that wasn't available 30 years ago. And we mustn't forget also, um, we've got online systems. Um, Pembroke has got its own um, AV4 online. The Glamorgan uh, group has put its East Glamorgan Atlas online. So these things are all accessible now and much easier to look at than they would have been 30 years ago. And we mustn't forget the lurks, of course. These weren't around at all in 1994. Um, and I've just highlighted the WWBIC region, which you all know. But interestingly, um, we found this very useful for this particular species, for example, common minnow, which is a food of the kingfisher. Uh, on Anglesey at the time, it was, the kingfisher was a rare species 30 years ago and just about starting to breed. And the, th the theory was that the common minnow didn't occur on Anglesey and it was a relatively recent introduction. So when we started looking at a derin um, and basically through the Covenant records, we were able to find that there in fact had been records of minnow since the 1960s. So the previous authors of the, um, the Anglesey AV fauna weren't aware of that. And simply because the records were now available to us, we could check that out. Um, and so get a better story on that uh, development of that species on, on Anglesey. So yeah, Adarian was really useful in that regard. Now let's have a quick look at some of the stories, I suppose, coming out of the book. There's a huge amount of stuff in the book. Um, it's not surprising, I suppose, that Wales is, you know, has really got some important species that are really important at a UK level. I mean, it's no surprise, I suppose, to me that chuff, you know, forms 80% of the population, that the UK population of chuff occurs in Wales. Um, as does hawfinch. You know, 70% of the hawfinches that we know about in, in the UK occur in Wales, mostly in North Wales, populations in South East Wales as well. But to be honest, compared with chuff, we know very, very little about hawfinches. It's a fair amount of ringing uh, going on of them now to try and discover more. But for these various other species, and you know, think of nuthatch, you know, we've got a quarter of the Welsh, a quarter of the population known in the UK, in Wales. We don't really know a lot about them. Um, so it's quite intriguing, really. Certain species have been looked at well, like Max Shewater, um, and to some extent, uh, Goshawk is now looked at by raptor study group people, but quite a few of them, you know, we, we, we know less about than we do uh, birds like chuff. And as for the wintering populations, we also have very high numbers, of course, of chuff, as you might expect. I don't quite know how it's 94% of the UK population, because I would have thought they're fairly res resident, but there must be large numbers uh, taken into account here. Um, and so Wales is you know, very important. But for common scoter, which is one of the species you would like to see offshore in places like Carmarthen Bay, Liverpool Bay, um, Cardigan Bay, We've got very, very large numbers of these birds. And in fact, work has been done on wind farms, particularly in, off the North Wales coast. It's been showing recently that there, there may be 50, 60,000 birds in that, in that sort of region. We get up to 50,000 in Carmarthen Bay. So we have a huge responsibility for things like common scoter, even if it is offshore. Um, and so any, any developments of the marine environment really do need to take these into account. It, is, it does seem to be the way you put wind turbines you create, you create sort of reefs which the shellfish like and the common scoters feed on, on shellfish. So it could be that it's actually giving them more opportunities to feed in, in places that might have been hostile in the past. Um, but yes, we've got a lot of responsibility for these birds. And so it's very important that we realize that. And we also know that some species have been lost over, over time. Some of them have been lost certainly before 1994. Uh, the crane, for example, stopped breeding a long time ago, although actually uh, they've started to breed now in, in Somerset from reintroduced um, birds down there. And there's been, there have been one or two pairs breeding in, in South Wales as well, on the Gwent levels, for example. So we may be at the point where the crane might return as a breeding species to Wales, but we're not quite there yet. We lost the bittern and we lost the goshawk, although a bit more about those in a minute. And we also lost the marsh harriers in the 19th century and hen harriers uh, were, were pretty pretty rare and these other things are just disappearing rapidly i mean the corn bunting went a long time ago it, it seemed well to, you know, 20 30 years ago um, and we've lost corn crakes even longer ago so you know it's very it's not all it's not all doom and gloom but there's an awful lot of things that have been lost but as for the return species um the, the bittern has returned briefly, well, I suppose you could say in the 50s to the 80s, went up to 15, 16 pairs breeding on Anglesey. Then they decline. They're now back again breeding in North Wales. And the possibility of spreading also now to South Wales as well, it seems to be on the cards. Goshawk 
um, came back in 1969. In fact, it started breathing in Carmarthenshire, but they, these are for reintroduced birds. They were kind of either deliberately introduced or escapes from um, raptor people. Uh, but the goshawk is now spread very widely in Wales, and Wales has probably got possibly the largest um, proportion of the UK population is in Wales. Um, marsh harriers have started to breed again in Anglesey, and they are also trying to breed in South Wales, so that, that's not quite a good news story. They're still very, very small numbers, but these are promising signs anyway. So we've lost some, but we've gained some. Unfortunately, when you start looking through the book, um, particularly at the more typical common, if you like, or small birds, passerines and things, you know, there's quite a lot of, of, of red, uh, red, red concern. This happens to be the yellowhammer, which from the British, from the breeding bird survey shows, you know, considerable declines have been happening since 1994 over that 30 year period. Um, it used to be a very common species here in Pembrokeshire, for example, we, you've really got to work hard to find them these days. Um, and it's a real concern that this, this, is, this farmland bird is, is not doing very, very well. And quite a lot of the farmland birds, unfortunately, are in steep decline. So the book is sort of highlighting these sort of issues. So it's, it's a, you know, it's not, all, it's not all good. Okay, so I'm going to sum up very quickly now um, on how we got there. Yeah, the, the original book was for 448 pages. That's what we, uh, we costed out. It was going to cost about £23,000, we thought. Um, but late in 2020, we realised there was an awful lot more information to go in and we needed to think about the costs again. And it ended up being a 581 page publication and we had to raise enough money to, to pay for £32,000. In fact, was the actual cost and a colossal amount of money, really. Um, and despite some initial concerns, by seeking sponsorship of species, um, we just about got over the, 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 the amount we needed, £32,000 we got there. And it's important to say that we've really thanked Lurk Wales, uh, all, all the Lurks in Wales, for, for providing help with the sponsorship and also Natural Resources Wales as well, so, you know, put some money in, which is really important. So thank you for your contributions. Our proofs were done by the 1st of November, which had to be done by then, and we got them in on time. And the publication was in July 2021 and on time. So let's just have a look at some of the, the numbers. Um, yeah, we spent at least 719 days, I think, you know, probably more than that myself, but there's a lot of days spent working on it. 28 checkers around Wales looking at the proofs, or looking at the drafts, I should say, 52 different authors, lots of consultants involved, uh, 44 photographers, one artist, 105 sponsors, so it was pretty impressive. Um, we covered 451 plus species, some subspecies as well, lots of new subspecies, in fact, had to be dealt with. And we also decided to put in the escapes um, that you know, we'd never been included in books before. So, you know, that was an interesting thing to do. The book, which is, which is huge, weighs 2.8 kilograms, lots of words, and lots of references, 1581 pages. We think reasonable value for 45 quid as a hardback. So far, we've only had pretty good reviews. There have been quite, there have been several. This just happens to be one of them. Not, I'm not going to read it out, but I mean, it, it was, it's a very positive review from somebody in the BTO. Yeah, we're pleased that it actually won, uh, uh, got some applause in the British Birds Journal, uh, came ninth in their top 10. Um, but um, so, it, you know, it is recognised as a standard reference, which we're very pleased about. And I suppose also pleasing that the politicians um, have been given copies. Um, we, did, we wanted to make sure the Welsh Government were, were involved with this and you know, they, they, they should be aware of what's going on with the bird populations in Wales. And um, it's great that Mark Drayford was pleased to accept a copy from Yola Williams. And um, so that was done this winter and um, hopefully it'll be put to good use. So anyway, just to acknowledge everybody who has been involved. Um, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of birders. Um, and I really respect Julian Hughes and Ian Spence for providing some of the information for this talk. And they say the lurk for the contributions and for WW Bick for asking me to do this talk. So very much thanks for listening. And if you haven't got it, it's a big heavy book, but it's worth a, it's a good read, I think. But I am biased. Okay. Oh, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, what a lot of work that goes into something like that. If we if we didn't already appreciate it. 